everybody, it's Cinnamon Cooney, your art tripper, and today we're going to paint in watercolor this really gorgeous fall scene with a barn. Mm. I'm going to do it in watercolor step by step during a live stream. I'm going to explain everything that I'm doing so that you can paint along with me at home. I'm going to tell you the techniques that I'm using. I'm going to demonstrate them. I'm going to show you the materials that I'm using and explain them. We're going to answer questions during live stream. If you have a question, um, it's best to put it in all caps, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, because that helps our moderator see it. If our moderators know the video or the answer, you may get help from them. And your question might also be asked during the live show. You never know. Just um, never know. And if somehow your question does not get answered, either by a moderator or uh, by me during the live, go ahead and leave it in the comments after the show because I go over those as well and check them. And, and if that, that still has not answered it, go ahead and write us at support at theartsherpa.com. Because I really do want to, you know, answer your art questions because that helps you paint. Mm-hmm. How are we doing today? It's Wednesday. It's watercolor Wednesday. Watercolor Wednesday. Let's talk about the materials in today's <sighs> class. We get to see Mini Sherpa. Mini Sherpa. Mini Sherpa says, I'm using a 9 by 12, 140 pound watercolor block. This is um, Fabriana's Artistico line. It's a traditional white. They have uh, different finishes. I really like this because... It's already glued down on all four sides. So when I paint, even if it's really, really wet application, the paper does not buckle on me uh, badly and cause me trouble. Colors. Payne's gray, nickel, ozzo yellow, Hansel yellow, medium, pyro red, quinacridone, magenta, ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, opera pink, transparent pyro orange, burnt umber, quinacridone gold, phthalo green. I don't necessarily use all colors from my palette in every class. There is a blog I wrote about all the beginner questions that you might have about joining this class, what materials you need. Um, I tried to, in the year 2021, just create a set of materials that I'm going to use from class to class so that you guys can uh, build those up and join. I also have information on how to just use what you have if you're just at home painting with Crayola. You know, how would you make that work? So we've got swatch pages and other resources to make that a little bit easier for you. I'm a little bit, if you follow me on the acrylic channel, you know I'm coming up to a big course in November. So I'm a little bit like, ah. <laughs> so I need the painting today too, John. Yeah, I get it. He, he does get it. He's a little bit afraid too. He's had a lot going so on in his afraid. week. So afraid. I can't, this, this sleeve, have you ever had the thing where your sleeve is just, it is just. Nope, never. I'm just a disheveled person is what it essentially is. I've never had any problems with my sleeves. No. They've always been perfect sleeves. Perfect sleeves. I have a T-square here, and I have the Credit Color Aquarelle pencil. You could use a regular pencil if you don't have this pencil. These are like watercolor uh, watercolor pencils, so it's just like your graphite pencil, but the lead in it is water-soluble, and so it'll behave like both a pencil and a watercolor. It's different than a watercolor pencil, Hmm. which is the pigment of black and a binder. This is graphite in a binder. You didn't know if you were like, why are those different? That's how they're different. Not that different. Okay, so it's wonderful. I'm going to just get right on into it. Okay. Paint today because I feel like it's that kind of day. I have some decisions to make. John's going to put the picture in picture. He's got today's uh, reference up. The traceable is going to come out after the show. And the reason for that is is that I'm going to make decisions artistically and I want to edit on the picture and change things. And because we're painting it live, It's just easier if I uh, throw up the traceable after the show if you're going to use that. But, hey, I highly recommend you just kind of paint along with me and give that a go, too. If you're like, no, now I'm going to watch and then redo, that's totally okay as well. So I've got the placement here of this barn and trees, and it's really kind of in the middle. It's a very static placement. The thing that's kind of exciting about it is it's a little bit off-center. So when compositions are like this, they tend to be a little restful. Uh, mentally, when they're very balanced, they can be restful. Now, that can make them boring, but sometimes restful is exactly what you need, (laughs) and it's okay to have a restful composition. I'm going to go ahead and kind of give myself some lines to think about. I'm going to come in the paper just a little bit below the halfway point, kind of in the lower thirds. Right? I'm going to go ahead and mark a little line that's going to be like, oh, hey, I might have, you know, a little fence here to do that little fence line kind of lets me know where my structures are now I've got these interesting little structures and this main barn it has a fun kind of little line that comes up it's a little triangular to the ground creature isn't it 
It reminds me a little bit of the barns in Midsummer. So, you know, that's a weird thought that it gave me. But maybe it's the time of year. I'm going to come down and make another little triangle and bring it over a bit because the roof line, if you look at this, does kind of go back. There we go. Got to follow those parallels. Creating that little sense of whatever is going on there. And then we've got a couple little triangular buildings here. Make a little triangle line here, with the roof coming back. And you can see that this line would be parallel with this line. Right? Mm -hmm. And this line would be parallel with that line. But we don't really see this line because there's another little triangular building that's sort of blocking that view. And it's coming back. So it's like a little run of buildings. And then we have an interesting little fence line that we could do. And um, we'll probably hit that a little later on. And I may even use some gouache to get those um, highlights and everything in the fence. When I know where this is, I can start kind of working the trees and the grass and things around our barns. We're going to definitely focus on some dry brushing techniques to create wood and when to paint kind of loose and expressively and when to tighten up to give a nice landscape effect. So we're going to go into all those things. I'm going to start out, I think, by taking a wash brush. This is a uh, petite aqua imitation squirrel. This particular one is the uh, 22, and I'm going to just get it wet. And I'm going to just use this to wet large areas of my surface all right, with water so that we can kind of start out painting the little yellow trees and background area in a very loose, expressive manner kind of imply they're out there we're going to start with some implications and then later we're going to get like super serious about it Ooh. yeah but right now let's just imply some stuff is going on when i have that in i might take my uh, handy dandy uh, this is the number 14 soft aqua that i've been using and up top i have sort of uh, an interesting green and then i have the yellow so i'm going to come in with my yellow i'm going to start with some nickel aza yellow i might get a little pyrrole red into it to warm it I'm going to just capture a very loose little sense of the trees at first. Right, this is loose, and it's going to be a very light color because we're going to paint lightest to dark. I'm going to wiggle my brush around. Because the paper's wet, you're going to see that... Um, it's kind of blooming a little. It's color softens and blooms and transitions through the image come along here in the little tree lines and I'll wiggle the little tree lines a little bit just to let them do that and again this is the soft first kind of look into this pretty wet pretty wet there. technique very light color now back here I have a little bit of green and it's a dark green it's like a forest green so I'm gonna come in with maybe some burnt umber let's try some burnt umber and phthalo green. You can see there's a little dark foresty green. And we're going to make sure that this is meeting our little tree line a bit. See, it's very loose though. I'm going to paint these little edges in a wiggly way. Ooh. Just a little bit. Not too serious yet. Hmm. You know? So that's pretty good. I like that. I might take a paper towel. I have kind of some stuff coming off the barn, so I might even lighten this area coming off the barn. This is me subtracting color. Oh. Right? And I might even pull some here, creating a little bit of lighter space, and maybe here. Where I'm going to talk about some tree bright like trees and things like that. Um, you can even come in with your pencil. Just speak a little bit to some trees that might be here.
The fun stuff about trees in the forest in this way is that you can actually get to do some negative space painting. That's the painting between the trees or the objects. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do that. So let's just make some loose little tree sketches. Now to get the tree trunks, we're just really running parallel lines next to each other. Those are lines that are running alongside each other. And they're very fine. We want them to be kind of multi-directional. Might have a little one right here and perhaps there's another one kind of coming along there. You can see some interesting ones here and there every once in a while. I like the watercolor pencil because it lets you do some sketching at the same time that you're doing painting. And that's kind of fun. Kind of. I'm going to go ahead and come down here and pre-wet all of this as well. I don't want it to be soaked, but I do want the paper to be damp. And this is one of those reasons why you've got to stretch or tape down. Um, there's a lot of recommendations on how to stretch paper, and I've got to make a video. Um, just about those things. I think after I get through this acrylic level one beginner course, I might do a watercolor one if I get some time. I'm going to come out and get some chest burnt umber and maybe some nickel ozzo yellow. Mm. I'm going to make some of this light color. I'll just brush that out. And while that's wet, I'm going to take my number 14. Let me come in. Quinacridone gold is a bit like burnt sienna. If you don't have this color, it's okay to grab some uh, burnt sienna. And I'm going to just make some loose little light streaks in what is going to be the grass. There's even a little bit of a green area up here, so I can kind of get some nickel azo yellow into my deep forest green mix. And you can see that this sort of does this blooming or blending or softening as well. I'm not trying to take everything to the edge of the paper. I'm not trying to do this landscape edge to edge. I'm kind of letting a little bit of an open area here. <laughs> and that's just because that's a choice that I'm making that I feel like artistically I rather like. Now, as we go, you will find that your color does a thing called shift where it lightens a bit. But if at any point you feel like it got too dark, you can always look, come back and tap out with your paper towel to sort of lighten. Oh, yeah. You know, so you're never too stuck. That's doing really well. I'm going to come back up into the area that is my trees. All right. So I'm going to take my quinacridone gold out. I've also got some transparent pyro orange, which is quite bright. And I've got my Hansa yellow. Right, which is lovely, and I've got my nickel ozo yellow, also lovely. And come here, the paper is kind of damp but somewhat dry. I'm going to paint a little bit of the tree shape. This is more of a shadow of the shape. We'll have a value down from this, and a, and we've got our value up. You've got to keep some of the lightest color that you have. Mm -hmm. right, you want to reserve some of that. <gasps> I just dipped in my coffee, so that's it for my coffee. Oh, no. I did it. Bye-bye, <laughs> coffee. Tap back a little bit. You could paint with coffee. I could paint a coffee. Notice that I was able to tap that back and kind oh. of lighten that color. I want to get a little of the green into this light area I can. We're going to just kind of paint these little trees out as we see them. I'm into the gold here. So the trick with the watercolor painting is painting the positive objects that you see and the spaces between those objects like the trees, the negative space. So sometimes you'll be painting away into the shadow, and sometimes you will be painting into the light. I will come in and lighten whenever it suits me.
With a little nickel Ozzy yellow, I really like that color. Mm. Grab a little of my green. And it's okay, I let it bloom up into what is going to be the tree above it. Everyone's feeling so bad for your coffee. It's just, you know what happens. It, Sometimes you lose, casualty you lose what you love. of watercolors. Casualties of watercolors. So it's not that um, paint is always particularly toxic, but some pigments are. And I use professional paints. And if you're using student paints, it's very rare that you would have a uh, very dangerous chemical or pigment in it because those are expensive to make and you would have noticed that in the price tag mm. like when you buy real cadmium you'll know you have real cadmium because you pay real cadmium prices do a little bit of connection on gold here A little bit of those trees in. Thinking a little of the trees, yeah? Mm -hmm. Little tree, a little tree. On the toe of my brush. Come here and add some nice little treetops. Mm -hmm. Little crisp edges to the experience there. Really, it's just about painting along. It's really cool. Just a gentle little... Gentle's a good word for watercolor painting. It's a gentle practice. Sort of these gentle trees. Always come in, you have some darker face in the trees. Mm. Along the top. You can see I'm just dancing the brush around. Mm -hmm. So in my acrylic, I rate things in one hoot and two hoot and three hoot ratings. And I'm going to say this is probably, you know, more in our three hoot kind of space. We're not even doing line and wash here where we have a little bit of line and wash, but really we're, we're kind of just painting. Yep. And so that makes it a little more complicated. And it's a landscape so that can add some challenges. Sometimes I'll put some darker kind of little lines in there to imply some trees, maybe their branches are perhaps a little further in. It's okay if they 
making me new coffee or you're giving me your coffee. Just you have a sip you're sacrificing mine. your coffee to me. Some sacrificial coffee. Come in and paint between this deadfall here or these trees here. Space between them. Bring that down and I'll grab a sip of coffee from John in just a second. Yeah, you're okay. It's nice to let things, you know, even soften out or kind of develop as they want to. I'm going to grab a little of my orange here. Kind of fun in a shocking color, but I like it. Let's keep painting on our little barn. I also yours. Do we have any questions as I'm going along? Let me flip over here. I gotta watch my neck and back. Um, because we'll I'm painting flat. Second. Now, in, a, in an ideal world, if you were painting in your home studio, I'm painting flat because that's good for the camera. That is not good for me, the artist. I yep. would want to paint on a slight angle. So a perfect watercolor space would have a table that you could tilt up and flatten as needed, right? So most of the time you paint most of your watercolor sitting very, uh, very well seated with a table slightly tilted up. Um, and then when you needed it to be flat for a technique, you would have the ability to lower it. So it's a type of drafting table, and it would have um, a way for you to stabilize it. You can sometimes get tabletop versions of this that you can put on a table. Um, the other thing is it lets you do a bridge and other things. But when you have to work on flat work and you're over it, you are kind of bending your neck and your body in an unideal way. And that's something to be just present of. And don't paint in your lap. I, you didn't ask that question, but I'm answering it. Do you talk about your color selection here? So, um, uh, turn right side. Up. Right now, I'm working mostly my nickel azo yellow, my burnt umber, my quinacridone gold, a little thalo green, transparent pyro orange. I got some hands of yellow medium in there. Oh, some, okay, uh, gotcha. Thalo gray. I was uh, paints gray. Joy. So mm -hmm. what I was doing is I have a side view camera that allows you to see kind of her her brush stroke from the side so it wasn't uh it's not sideways it's just sort of a side camera view yeah so that's all sometimes we try to uh, there, yeah. change the camera angle so you can see things from a different position and sometimes it will help you see what the brush is doing better um yeah we'll switch back and forth between them yeah yeah but i'm not i don't even have this on my turntable that i use for my uh paintings mm -hmm. this is really nice we have any other questions? I think it's a quiet day. Oh, the the color selection. Could, this is a really pretty color selection. Can you talk about why what what colors you're using to make these? So I just did. Okay, <laughs> that was I was reading and uh, uh, and queuing up questions. So you know, no, no, that's okay. And the reason I picked these is these warm colors make great fall colors. It makes this a lot of fun to do. It'll be layering and splattering and some expressive techniques, and we'll build up and build up, and you'll find that you have. You know, kind of some point at the end of it, you'll have a very nice little forest that you're looking into. Hmm. And that's always sort of enjoyable. But you've got to kind of get these things down. Um, and it takes this paper a little while to completely hard dry. So actually, there's still some dampness. Some people like to wet both sides of the paper and tape it down. They like soak it, like even 10, 15 minutes and tape it down, especially on heavier papers. One, to address the buckling, and two, so that the paper holds the moisture longer. Hmm. This is cotton. It just tends to hold it longer anyways. This is Fabriano, and the sizing is great, and the cotton is great. It's great, great, great. Great, great, great. Great, great, great. Great, great, great. Other papers are great, too. This is just my favorite. I don't make it. <laughs> I'm not involved in the making of the, of the, of the product. Nickel, Ozzy, and continue on. I'm doing the tops of my trees right now, and I'm using the toe of my brush. And the reason I'm doing this, and I might even get some more into my Hansel yellow, is because I've got to come back and paint the space here with some darker colors. We want sort of a hard edge maybe between these two spaces a little bit. I have to decide value-wise how dark I want to go into the trees in the back, and I can promise you it's pretty dark. It's pretty dark, my friends. Mm. And again, I have my watercolor pencils, so I have some opportunities here that they afford me that I rather like. 
that's nice and dark. I will just go ahead and smooth that out, lighten that out. Keep doing some of those different little trunks that are showing through. Rinse out and get some nice lousy yellow. Uh, watercolor is a very deep community. Um, mm -hmm. If you're That's loving this, sure. like Joy, if you're loving this, I really need you to join the Watercolor Society if you can. You can swing that and get your membership and join that society in your local area, anyone who loves it. Um, the reason is, is that the Watercolor Society provides a tremendous amount of education in the medium through the society. And you can take classes from teachers that are world famous in the medium. Teachers that could really change it for you. You know, and uh, my mom always had a membership when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And I was primarily into watercolor when I was young. Watercolor, pastels, um, chalk, and pencil. That's not unusual for somebody who's younger because those mediums are portable. They don't have a huge uh, cost of barrier to set up. Mm -hmm. I'm adding a little more pyro orange as I come down. So it's not unusual for, for new artists or young artists to be into those types of mediums. Not unusual. But I do recommend joining the Watercolor Society and taking as many courses as is in your budget. I mean, they're, they're generally like under $100. Sometimes they're in the $40 range. And when you see who's teaching, it'll just explode your brain. And they even kind of sometimes will uh, pay for teachers to come in an area. They uh, offer juried exhibitions. They offer you opportunities to grow as an artist. Um, and, um, whether you're a hobbyist and all hobbyist means is that you're not doing it professionally. You could be doing it very seriously. You could be very skilled. You could be winning art shows. You just haven't quit your day job. Right. <laughs> right. Um, that's all hobbyist means. <laughs> Sometimes people hear hobbyist and they think that, um, you know, somebody is being insulting, but in this particular case, no. Come along here with maybe some darker colors and kind of edge that branch a bit. Always interesting to me to play that out. While this is all having a thought or a dry, she might come in and actually do some soft work through it, actually. Soft work is that I've got some wet paper down and I'm going to add some wet values of color that I'm allowed to bloom out mm -hmm. to create those classic soft watercolor effects that we all think of when we think of watercolor. where you can always come back and lighten up. And the great thing about paper is sometimes it gives us some great effects that are like trees. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Wow. You can't beat it. Pretty, pretty sharp. I'm going to get into my bright brush and I'm going to work some of the um, downward grass and do some dry brushing and some value work. First, I get it wet, and I kind of wipe it out on my paper towel, and I'm going to pick up a little of my uh, green here. And I'm going to make some little dry brush rough scratches. Isn't that fun? So this is dry, and the brush doesn't carry a little water, and it has a very light application of pigment, and that's where this uh, ability is going to come from. I like this because there's a bit of this texture to the field. And that's uh, one of the things that attracted me uh, to this particular piece is that I could come in and uh, use this brush. This is, if you're wondering, a number 10 soft aqua. Never used this brush before, before our art retreat that I did. And um, I had grabbed a bunch of brushes from the maker, Raphael, through Savile Fair. And um, they had put this in there and we all loved it so much. I, uh, the company actually donated the brushes to the people huh. who went to the retreat because I was so in love with this brush. Grabbing a 
bunch of the different little fall colors that I've mixed. I'll come along the barn here and kind of make sure that this has got that sort of soft edge. Even though I know I'm putting in a fence, mm -hmm. I'm be painting in a much darker barn. I want this to have a soft little edge. I'm going to take advantage of the way that this brush lays down paint. And I may come back with dark color into it. Okay. Um, to counterbalance that out. Fan brushes will also do this if you're like, oh man, I don't have that. You can just grab a fan brush. That's also okay. You can see I'm doing different little directions and just making sure that there's this sense of, I like that little great color I got there. Get a little gray here. Just push that over here. Fun to do. Do we have any questions while I'm doing the mini blades of grass and pushing bushes? Push that corner there. Push that corner. I'm trying, I'm reading up what uh, Joy's questions were here. Joy's probably got some very good questions. I think I got half of it. I love this painting, by the way. It's just a fun day with a fun painting, isn't it? Just a fun painting to do. Do watercolor fadings paint over, over time? Joanne was asking that. They can. Um, that's again, much like with the acrylic or oils or pastels quality definitely improves longevity. Um, there's a lot to do. Uh, it, you get good paints. Like I'm painting core, Saint LA's, uh, uh, Aquel, a really good French artist watercolors. I'm painting core watercolor, um, Daniel Smith, um, some Holbein. Those colors are going to hold longer. Um, good paper not hanging it in direct bright sunlight, framing it behind glass. If that glass is museum quality with a UV coating on it, really, then we have really old watercolors. Mm -hmm. So care definitely, definitely impacts it. But there are, there are watercolors, I think, that fade very quickly. So Joy was just giving you affirmation saying that she really appreciates you because she has trouble learning as effectively from other teachers. Oh, well, I appreciate you very much, Joy. I appreciate um, all you guys that come in and are part of our art class and our art family um, and share your art online and come chat. I think it makes this whole learning process just better for me, for you, for everybody. It's just wonderful. I am making sure that I've got some smooth areas kind of alternated with these little grass areas. I'm not all solid grass all the way through. And you, you might be like, well, it, it looks like it's all solid grass all the way through. It, yeah, it does because it is. But by giving some visually smoother areas of rest, it will actually help us affect the field nicer. Getting some stronger uh, little burnt umber here to put right there in this. Oh, Perhaps a darker little here. patch of grass. See that that creates that sense of what's going on. And sometimes it's what we paint, but it's also what we don't paint that matters. I grabbed a little nickel ozo yellow and you get these very dry brush down here. Oh. I can go up if I want a very long tapered grass and I can come down if I want a short, almost like mowed or broken off grass. Do love this brush. I don't get a commission in any way from this. <laughs> I don't have one of these for sale. I, I, I'm not saying I never would have these for sale in my store. I'm just mm -hmm. saying I don't currently. So you know my bias isn't based on that. You really like everybody at the company. The little brush there's always like a lot going on with brushes people have very strong feelings about brushes my mom uh, was always asking me you know have you found a brush like this have you found a brush like that people have the brushes that they like and the experience that they like 
I can tell you what I'm into mm -hmm. and what I'm enjoying, but that doesn't mean that you haven't found something that's better for you. That's just something to keep in mind because we all have slightly different processes. I'm really digging this. I really texture. am too. It just is exactly what I was in the mood for today. Getting a little more of my gray out. Very light pressure that I'm trying to do. Sometimes I take the brush stroke across and up and kind of work it around up and down. I wonder if I could recreate my favorite class that I took from my childhood at the Watercolor Society. Hmm. There is this lady we took a class from. She was a Southwest artist, and she did this thing with torn tape to create Southwest landscapes. Oh. And I think for me, it was a pivotal moment as an artist. I think my mom was just in the class just happily buzzing along. But I think for me, it, like, it exploded my brain about rigid ideas I had about how you could get things done. Mm-hmm. Right, because when you're young, I'm just pushing this brush forward. You think very linear in your art process, and I think when you're new to art, you think very linear in your art process. You put paint on your brush and you make a mark, and that mark represents something. And if you put a bunch of marks together, well, you get a painting. And she was like, "No, let's tear tape." And I was like, "What? <laughs> what madness is this woman?" And she got us to do big sheets of paper. So I was working like twenty by thirty sheets of paper. Uh, which was very exciting, and it was like uh, Arches 300-pound mm. uh, watercolor paper. John remembers this because it smells like a wet cat because of sizing on it when you get it wet. In fact, I, I mm -hmm. got bullied in school over my watercolor paper smell in art class. <laughs> there was this very popular girl who was not happy with the smell of my wet watercolor paper <laughs> and did not understand about the sizing. She didn't appreciate it. She didn't. I wonder where she is today. You ever wonder where your bullies are today? Mm. Or where they are today? Not often. No, John probably doesn't. I don't want anything bad to have happened to her. I just I think she really didn't like my watercolor <laughs> paper smell. Sizing was not her favorite. Just added these little brush strokes there. That I did, I loved it. I used to get my art stolen a lot too. Mm -hmm. it used to freak me out. I'd break into my locker and steal my art. I was like, <laughs> what? Are Why are you doing this? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> it's still happening today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so bad. I'm not even looking for it already, too. And I was looking to find an old birch tree picture of mine and ran into a bunch of stolen art. And mm -hmm. like, oh, my gosh. It's so funny. I don't think that ever, ever ends. I think it just goes on. It doesn't really keep me up at night anymore, though. Just keeping this random around because I just want that feeling of that nice field. I'm really liking that. Yeah. Get a little yellow, perhaps a little green. I want to exaggerate that here because I just think that color is very nice in this space. From here, I'm going to start thinking about maybe my barns. A little burnt umber and quinacridone gold. Come back the opposite way into my grass and go back to painting my barn in. I just didn't want to lose my texture. Mm. Kind of painting that in that first level of brown. Maybe get some gray into it. Straight lines are my kryptonite. 
I have some very dark barn over here. I might, so I'm going to take my, this is interesting. I'm going to yeah. take my ultramarine blue, my burnt umber, and even a little of my Payne's gray. Come underneath here and think about the shadow. It comes back into the grass. I'm going to paint it back into the grass as well. But then come cleanly across here and down here. And to make a wash coming down the roof. It's got a little bit of this color that I had mixed over here in it. And I don't mind that this roof line is going to soften into that roof line. I kind of actually initially want that. And then I'm going to take a little of my uh, rust here, my quinacridone gold, and I'm going to, while this is still wet, Speak to a little bit of that coming down the building. You'll notice I come across here to sort of create a stop line to the roof. And then I'll continue on this way again with that darker color. As crisp as I can be along the top of the roof line. You'll find with architectural stuff, if you're a person who naturally gets a very crisp line, you'll get a better building. I'm creating a light gray wash here on these roofs. And I'll go ahead and grab just a on the corner of the brush, like a little bit of that Quinn. That's such a good rusted roof color. I'll just brush that down. Having some fun. How are you doing, sir? You okay? Yeah, I just had my mic off. Just bringing a little bit of this across. I'm letting the, the, the brush sort of speak or imply some, the beginnings of some wood thought. It's starting to think about its wood. It's like that song, Norwegian wood. Is there a song Norwegian would? I think so. I feel like there isn't, but I don't know that, so I don't know how to have that uh, uh, debate. I'm Google it because, like, there was like just a start on our barn here. It's got lyrics, so I'm guessing, yeah. <laughs> song by the Beatles. Okay. Not losing my mind. <laughs> Why did? Oh, that's so weird. I did not know that Beatles song. Oh, that's okay. Like at all? Like in my album, and, and, in my mental album of Beatles songs. And I think that before that, it was also a like, um, orchestral assemblage. Okay. Like ancient. Anyway, what do I know? Many things, I think. Not enough some days. There, I make sure that that's like a bit of a not as lifted.
straighten my walls. <laughs> just on my number 14 round again, and I'm just yeah. kind of adding some. shadows and hard edges to the lines. Under this roof, believe it or not, here with this color, my paint's gray. Kind of a crisp line here. Yeah, Ashley and a lot of folks just like hanging out and chatting with folks. Not very often do we have a chance to do that kind of stuff. I think, uh, yeah, I think we've all gotten a little kind of disconnected. Yeah. And some little lines down here, sort of talking about the planks and implying it. The paper here is not hard dry. It's just a mild bit damp. So what will happen is this will soften a smidge, mm. a smidge into what's below it. <laughs> I'm going to take some blue here, kind of dry brush it. Fun to do. Uh, blue creates some very unexpected little moments in a painting. Mm -hmm. And I like to use it, especially if you see yourself having like lots of oranges and, and things, It'll it's really good to get into. A dry brush coming down here. This is with my round, a little bit of that blue. And I can come back with a damp brush and look, I can soften it. I don't want to take away all my light values. I need my light values. A little weird. Mm. Get a little brown. Come under this little building. Just a little there. Just a little. Get a little of my background gold. And I can even come in with my pencil, believe it or not, and crisp any lines that I want to. Hmm. I'm like, man, that needs to be a little bit more. And because it's watercolor, I can always come back and like lighten it with water. Hmm. With the, the pencils you can light. Yeah, with the watercolor pencils. It is looking really good. Adding some little kind of openings and some bits in the barn. You got to get in the barn, right? Mm -hmm. Where are you going to go if you can't get in the barn? Well, there's no barn door to leave open, so you're pretty okay. Well, it's right here. Oh. But there's it's... a little bit of a barn door. And for all we know, the main opening of the barn is the back. It's true. 
Don't count your. We barn can doors never really be closed. sure. <laughs> That's true. Create some little fences. Little fence across here. Now it's interesting. I have gouache, so I can actually come back without frisket and get a highlight going on my fence. Hmm. And that will. Be something I'm grateful for. Now this fence on my painting is a little bit in disrepair mm -hmm. and that's okay. I have a little bit in disrepair fence. Just a little gesture. Isn't that nice there, that little gesture oh, yeah. fence? in with a little bit of a dark watercolor and maybe speak to some of these. Apply some little distant branches. Distant branches happen. Hmm. A little wash. Knock it back a bit. Not so forward. It's just it's just too forward, my friends. It's just too forward. Let's get a little bit of our dark uh, forest color. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And I'm going to come here and make sure that my uh, tree line. into a fairly nice sharp edge. Now, if you remember what I mentioned about the paper towel, what I can mm -hmm. do is crumple one up. Kind of a ball. Oh, wow. Help create the sense of some distant trees while allowing that to be quite dark. Yeah. I can even come in with a little bit of Payne's Gray while it's all still wet and create some of those softer, deeper shadows in some of the spaces. That might be working its way up in through some of the trees. Isn't that a lovely way to get that effect? It really is. Again, a little of your thalo green and your quinacridone gold. And it doesn't go back to white because we pre-stained it with our forest green. We made a plan.
Very nice little treetop line mm -hmm. with a nice distant forest. There we go. Distant forest. So gray for the deep, deep shadow. I have to say, I rather like this. It really is nice. Thank you guys for letting me have a second channel and supporting that second channel where I get to do some watercolor. Um, you know, I really rather enjoy the medium. Yeah. And I enjoy this type of painting and this type of time with my resources, my mediums, in my studio. It's a... Uh, it's so fun. It's so, you know, I can come along here and create some interesting tree lines. I like the the sharp green on top of the uh, yellow. It's very beautiful, isn't that? Mm-hmm. And because this was dry and this was dry, we get a nice sharp edge to it. You could also have wanted very soft transitions to it. It really is up to you as the artist what type of, you know, effects you do in the background. Hmm. It's really dark eyes here. That's looking pretty darn good, I feel. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty happy with this even here. I might switch out my water. Um, it's not that this water is dirty, but it's just getting a little murky. Yeah. And I still want to have bright colors, so I'm going to switch out to some clean. Might come in with a little, I'll pre, uh, prime my... This might be hard for you to see. My gesso is up in a really wonky place. Hold on, I'm gonna move. That. I'm in, I'm not gesso. Um, gouache. There you go. I'm gonna pre-wet it so it's starting to activate, and then I'm gonna let that sit for a minute so that kind of really, really reactivates, and then I'll put in some highlights on that while I'm waiting to do that. I think I'm gonna come in and get a little of my transparent pyro orange, a little of my quinacridone gold. Maybe paint some shape to some of these little trees. <laughs> you can get into this as deep as you want or as loose as you want. With watercolor, you have so many options. You have so much choice. Get a little more yellow going. Keep playing, playing, playing. with those edges a bit.
down here it can get you know much darker it's just very calming it is calming i'm probably being too calming myself <laughs> nah it's just nice to have a little time with your with your painting Remember, you can splatter, which is really kind of a nice thing to do in fall paintings. Mm -hmm. Cause that can feel very much like a fall color. It's going everywhere, as it does. Mm -hmm. If you're worried about any of your splatters or splashing getting onto any area of your canvas or anything, you can mask it off with paper towel. If you're like, I don't want any on the barn or I don't want any here, you would just go through and just mask that off. The brush to do the splatter has to be kind of wet. And I like the results of it if the paper is wet in a few places so that there's a few hard droplets, but then also um, blending droplets, right? So like if I didn't want any splatter on my grass, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty easy to do. I don't do the true brush method with this one. And the reason is is because um, I don't want to whack the handle on my brush and dent it. I'm just doing the finger tap and I really have to get enough on here where it will do it. Wow. Really is nice. <laughs> I made a funny sound. Did you? I don't know. I feel like, you know, I'm Take somewhere. Take some glue for some unexpected pop. You what? I think I definitely came from the land of Muppets because I come with sound effects. and. Sometimes Ooh. you do. Mm. <laughs> I can come back with some water and even take some of my splatters and control them a bit. Move them to a couple places. The blue, as it dries, will pull in, and it's going to create some really special moments. The other colors that you can use to create special moments in something like this um, might be, I'm going to switch over to my um, wonderful little bright here, and I'm going to get some of my Hansa yellow, in, and I'm going to begin to make, it's not like a fan brush, but I'm going to make some structures that might have more of that. Kind of feeling to it right here. So that's another nice thing to do is you kind of alter up foliage a bit. Where you can. I'm switching through the yellows and reds and oranges and browns, just trying to get some nice variants. And you can see this brush makes a different structure in the foliage. I'm going to try this other view. See how that gives you a different foliage effect? It really is neat. And you can even use that around different places where you want to have some different textures. You've got splashes, you've got structure, you've got soft, you've got hard. And I think that that's the fun of watercolor is, is playing those effects against each other.
compress that sort of foliage through here, or maybe there's a bit of a shadow pushing that along in shadow. Mm. And make some little cross beams on some of these branches. A little bit. like to paint the space between these. Mm. so that they're peeking through. At this point, my gouache is fairly uh, primed, which mm -hmm. is the opaque. So gouache is a bit like an opaque watercolor. I'm going to add just some highlights to my fence. And a couple of things in my painting. Or you can also come into your trees again. With your gouache. Mm -hmm. And add some counterbalancing little twig bits. Little twigs and things peeking out. Little highlights on the fence. You like the little highlights on the fence? Mm hmm Quite a bit. Maybe a little highlight on the edge of the barn. And again, you could have held this with frisket if you wanted to, and that wouldn't have been wrong. Hmm. I really like that. It's just enjoyable. Yeah, just little highlights in there. It's a fun little barn painting. Fun little day of barn painting. Very much like this. Mm -hmm. I like the barn. Yeah. I as well am fond of barn. <laughs> barn is good.
Applying a couple little cross joints where the wood might have been joined very lightly. And like maybe this. I'll soften this blue a bit into the gray. It's not gone. I just don't want the hard edge. Right. So that it's a little in the distance. And it came, this is a cross, kind of cross blending with just a damp brush to soften that. So it's just, you just play. Right. Just play. Just enjoy. Just play. Just mixing the pyro orange with a little bit of the brown and the yellow. Oh, yeah. Maybe a little bit here and there. Interesting. Hmm. Joyce says, incredible white masking fluid can be colored with non-staining watercolor so you can see where you put it and it doesn't mask the, and it doesn't mark the paper. And that cra that stuff is the best, right? Huh. That stuff, did you get, they have a book they recommend on masking techniques. You got to get it. If you are. Into it. You know. Into I have it. to say, if you've been. Um, if you've hung out with the Dread Pirate Roberts at all, you know that masking is an art form. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to get quite popular soon. I, I, think, I think everyone's going to be doing it. I'm adding a little blue to my gray so that some of this, this and this and this, or maybe another location in the painting, just, just for balance. Guys, I'm pretty happy with this. I think this was just a fun day. There's little bits more you could do. You could continue to play. You could um, go deeper. You could be lighter. It really isn't. There isn't a right or wrong. It's just, you know, how it's going today. So I've gotten my uh, credit color pencil wet. I'm going to come over this so they can see you sign that. And oh. I'm going to sign it with the pencil and a drop of water. I know. That's weird. Kind of cool. I've been into that lately. Why? No reason. No specific or important art reason. <laughs> I'll let you know if something I'm doing is for very important art reasons. Sometimes I'm just... Just to doing... Just doing to do. I'm going to pick up that extra water. That collected there. There we go. That was fun. Next week, we've got a really great boat and ocean scene. Um, grab a sea sponge. I expect to use a sea sponge for um, some of the sand. I might do some splattering. Mm. We're going to continue to do dry brushing um, very much in a, in a similar sort of little space. And then um, when we go through November and I'm doing the beginner acrylic classes, I may go back to some one hoot watercolors for just a little bit, just simpler things to kind of paint and uh, get into uh, maybe stuff a little more holiday oriented over uh, um, over that time. Um, so we will still be meeting on uh, our Wednesdays with the exception of when um, the uh, daily beginner step-by-step -step paintings are happening. Because like on the 14th through the 23rd, we meet every day for a very short but an easy beginner painting. That's on the acrylic channel. So that week we might not check the calendar on the website, theartsherpa.com. If you'd like to know more about the beginner acrylic course that I'm offering, um, if you go to the website now, it's on the landing page. It says, uh, start here, beginner <laughs> acrylic course. 
start here. I realized I needed to start here. And I think I'm going to have to do a start here for watercolor. Um, I don't expect to have that going before January, but I might. You never know. I, I'm very busy, but you never know. Because I think it's a good idea to have a place where people can go, I start here. Mm-hmm. I know nothing, and I just want to start somewhere that isn't horrible. And so that's what I'm working on. Let me know if I did a good job with the acrylic. If I did a good job with the acrylic, we'll use it to model what we do with the watercolor. Does that sound fun? That, that's a fun. Okay. Guys, really thank you for supporting the channel. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your creativity. Be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And I want to see you at a watercolor tablet very soon. Bye-bye.